Hello, folks. Welcome to Between Awesome and Disaster. This is your host, Will Carey. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you guys being here. And uh, I want to do something at the beginning here. I want to... I want to uh, I want to hear from from you guys. Uh, for if you're a listener of this show, and you want to get in touch with me, I would uh, greatly encourage you to do so because I want to hear from the people who are listening to the uh, on the show, and I would love to read some of your messages uh, in my intros here. Uh, you can uh, you can message me uh, on Twitter. I'm at Comic Will Carry. You can also message the podcast at Awesome D Pod, and uh, I'm on Instagram at Will Carry Two Three. Uh, those are three ways that you can find me, and uh, you can follow me on all those platforms as well. Um, and I would love to be able to to hear from some of you folks and uh, re- and read some of your messages in my intro here, because uh, I really appreciate you guys being here as always, and I want to con- uh, connect connect uh, with you guys out there in the the internet, as the as the kids would say. Um, where am I? Where am I at? Um, I'm feeling. I'm, I'm feeling. I was pretty down uh, last week be, over um, because of uh, Steve Whalen's uh, death. I'm feeling. I'm feeling better this week, and I'm feeling pretty good uh, because I just had a very uh, great uh, interview uh, with my guest today, uh, who is comedian Jared Fried. Jared is, is a guy I knew uh, from my from the open mic days at the Creek in the Cave, and then uh, I haven't seen him in a while. Uh, and his and he's doing uh, incredibly well. And I, I'd kind of been following uh, his career through his website and through social media. And I know I and my one indication that his uh, his comedy career has been going great is that we've had to we have had to reschedule this podcast uh, multiple times because he's gotten spots offered at the last minute, which uh, he was apologetic for, but he didn't need to be because I will never fault a comedian for needing to reschedule because they got a spot because that is ultimately what we're all trying to do uh when you really when we when you think about it is get on stage so absolutely no troubles there jared but uh i i really really enjoyed this this chat i thought this was this was a very funny vibrant uh lifeful uh conversation about comedy and i am looking forward to getting to share it with you guys uh i'm also getting married in less than 90 days that's crazy to me that's crazy to me i never thought that was going to happen but i'm very excited for that that's uh come together and uh and i'm just i'm in i'm in a pretty good place i'm in a pretty good place today um probably gonna uh have another uh episode uh ready and edited and i've got some other cool interviews this week this is a busy week for 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 uh for me for podcasting so i'm excited to get to share some of these conversations with you guys and uh Right now, uh, let, without further ado, let's go uh, to my chat with, com- with uh, comedian Jared Freed. Sounding good, man. Um, I'm glad that you're, you're here because I feel <laughs> like, and I know we've had to reschedule a bunch, but yeah. um, when, I, when I reach out to you initially for about doing the show again, uh, well, again, the first time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, cause you're like, I feel like there are so many comics that I, I remember from that era of the Creek, like in sure. the early 2010 when we were, uh, all just kind of trying to find out who we were figuring and it then, out. and then I didn't see you for a number of years. And then I started looking up and I was like, wow, is Jared famous? Did oh. he, <laughs> did, did he get, fa- did he get like super successful and I didn't notice it? No, I, uh, <laughs> no, I, um, no, it's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting. It's like uh no that it's nice that um I've always just been like doing stuff all you know it was you know like going to the creek was like part of everything that I've was doing. Yeah. You know like going there to me like was like okay there's an open mic here amongst like but I have to do 3 a day. Mm-hmm. You know so like doing you know so I I yeah like n- I'm still trying to figure it out and still trying to find people to like what I do. Um, Uh But I, I think, um, yeah, I was just always like, like there was a certain, you know, area of comedy that I was like, I I'll do it when it comes up, but I'll never, it's not like something that I'm going to make my life. Sure. You know, like I was like, if it's three times on a, if I have to go on stage three times on a Monday night, like to do an open mic, to work on a bit, Mm-hmm. And one of those times is the creek. 
it's going to be fantastic to go there and be amongst all these people that are like hustling and are like the people that are like really wanting to do creative, cool stuff. Uh-huh. But then also you're going to go to like the Broadway open mic where <laughs> yes. it's maybe people that their understanding of what they wanted to do in comedy was different. Sure. You know, like the idea of like creating a new web series wasn't in their thought process. They're like, well, I'm going to be doing stand up and I'm going to bark to make sure that people come to the show. And like, you know, like it, it, it does feel like two different worlds a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I always felt like you're one of the people that I, I know that. And I think Brandon Ayer and all of the rad dude cast guys sure. are, are in, in the soak as well. I feel like you always straddled both word worlds pretty well because i have two very specific memories okay. rel- related related to you <laughs> um the first one was uh, i think the the mic when you and rg daniels who's yeah. been on the show when you guys used to co-host the friday mic at the yeah. creek i think that was the first time i'd ever shotgun a beer that's hilarious in yeah, my yeah, entire yeah. life <laughs> so i remember yeah. that and then i remember another time uh being at stand up new york and you were on stage having a great set and you were doing some crowd work. Like there was like a very high pitched whistling uh, that was coming from the crowd. Okay. And it was from this black guy and not just like, like he was like, I don't know if he was from like Sierra Leone or whatever. But sure. Uh, and you had some excellent riffing about this like high pitched Tweety Bird whistle coming from this big black dude. Yeah. Like it's not an unexpected. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, this isn't who I imagined who I was going to be talking to. Sure. I, I, it's, um, it's funny that open mic I remember was called it starts at four Mm -hmm. and the whole joke was that it never started at four. Like we always start late, but it was like a lot of people that would come we'd shotgun beers. And like, Uh I, I, I think for me, um, like I was always like, it was always nice to like, it's hard to make your like, um, you want to find places to like let your personality shine. And my personality shines with shotgunning beers, but I, yes. Um, but with like the, the open mic stuff, like it's like the, all that stuff. So miserable. And like mm-hmm. everyone's like in this, you know, kind of like, especially in New York where everyone's like trying to do their own thing. And you go, you want to sure. hear like the, you want to hear the joke that you've never heard before. And everyone's, everyone's just new. And yep. I, again, like m- Like, we're all looking to find a way to be successful at comedy, like, in our own ways. And success can mean different things to different people. Mm -hmm. So I remember, like, to me, I was like, like, again, this was like another, like, thing where I'm like, okay, the creek has to be, is a part of my life for, like, when I, when it happens. And I remember this was before, you know, I, I was like, okay, well, I, here's an opportunity to start an open mic with someone that I was friendly, the, uh, friendly with. I haven't seen RG in years. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, like, I was like, let's start an open mic together. And yeah, we yeah. started it and I was like, oh, it's a good opportunity for me to like ingratiate myself into this world, like into this, you know, to me, like I, I know that like when I started doing comedy, I couldn't believe that um, that I looked like a bro to people like I didn't really <laughs> think about that. Right. So like I think when I started, people were like, oh, who's this bro guy that like like I was kind of shocked by that 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 was even like thought of me. Cause I was like, Oh, all my friends kind of look like me, you know? Like uh-huh. I, I was like, we'd make fun of other people who acted like bros. Like, sure. you know, so like I was kind of given this, like, especially by the Creek people who weren't around people like that all the time that maybe didn't see guys that were like, you know, coming out of a fraternity and uh-huh. all that stuff. They were like, Oh, you're that guy to us. And I was like, Oh, I guess it just, you know, it's just all about perspective. It, it, it's, and, it's all perspective and relatively because uh, I think and I was just thinking about this. Like I, I grew up in Maryland mm-hmm. uh, to my fiance who was born and raised in Brooklyn. Yeah. I am a Southerner. If yeah. I was to talk yeah. to someone from <laughs> South Carolina and say, oh, I'm from the South. I'm sure. from Maryland. They would say, you can go fuck yourself. Yeah, they right? would be angry. You could go fuck yourself right now. So that's hilarious to me because because I imagine like, yeah, to like the the group and and, and vibe at that time at the, at the Creek, you could probably... It, I think they just associate any kind of like intense beer drinking with that's what a bro does. Yeah. an intense intensity. Like I was talking about dating. Like I like wanted to talk about like going on dates. Like I really did feel like I could talk about dating in a way that was a little bit different. That was yeah. a little bit like um, the things that my friends were going through. And like I had friends of mine, female and male, like reaching out to me being like, we discussed dating stuff mm-hmm. and it was interesting to us. So I was like, 
I remember getting the vibe, and this might not be fair, but like I would talk about dating something, people were like, oh yeah, yeah, who's date? Oh yeah, oh whoa, Mister Privilege going on a date. And I'm like, I don't know. I thought <laughs> I thought we were all going through this. Like I was like, I I don't know. It kind of felt like I was, um, you know, I would give people credit. I'm like, oh, you're going for that type of thing. I'd be like, oh, you're doing. Like if someone went up and talked about like, like. Or did some like weird Andy Kaufman esque? If they went weird kind of off the board, I would go, "Wow, that's like that thing." <laughs> like I would go, "Oh, that's cool." I can, I get how someone would love that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like uh, you yeah. start seeing like you you see like ev- what everyone's uh, end goal is, or what er- or where everyone's starting. Like you yeah. see the in the influences, sure. And then like those folks all like they've all a lot of them now are doing like cool like experimental video sure. video things and and podcast stuff uh th- i love that joe perez got a ca- a cartoon on adult swim yeah. where he just he just talks you to sleep that's uh, that's just like it makes so much sense it makes sense it's it's and it's funny to me like and yeah. I, I i actually love that like i love that but i also knew that wasn't me like you know yeah. so i i think it was always a little frustrating that like i i don't know if the credit was given both ways like i think a lot of what i do could be considered like oh that's mainstream or that's you know club comedy or like whatever it is and i'm like uh-huh. and i'm like yeah that exists too it like does. both things exist i i think pete holmes uh, that you mentioned before like yeah, yeah. Uh, he's the uh, you don't have to if you like chocolate doesn't mean fuck vanilla and yeah. he said that I, th- I lifted that from him i think I, I that sounds like something he would say. I'm gonna credit Pete Holmes with with that now, but if he didn't say it, still do my show. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but I I kind of say that a lot now, where it's like I there is this whole mentality of like I love chocolate, and then someone goes, yeah, right, fuck vanilla, right? And you're like, no, I I think that I like vanilla sometimes too, and it it's just for different occasions, and some people love it more than I do, and yeah. <laughs> that's okay too. Yeah. Um So it was always like, I think with that like that open mic that I did um, where I was like, it was an opportunity to be like, yeah, I'm just a guy having fun doing it this way, you know, where Mm -hmm. it was a nice thing to be able to like have people like have fun with comedy and be a little less like serious or be a little bit more their own bro their bro own bro self, like not to make it more than it was, but I, and that mic was, and that make, and that mic was fun. Cause, cause, and, and again, you're speaking, true to your to like who who, what your life is and what your experience is and that's what i think any great comic yeah should be doing i just want to be honest i don't want to be dishonest and be something i'm not yeah you know and i and i think this and i think that person and i think that perspective comes with age because i i remember and i don't know what you were like when you were getting into i don't Mm -hmm. know if you got into comedy in your early 20s or was 25 25 so i started when i was uh, 23 Mm mm-hmm so I, I think I had a couple, I remember having a couple of years where like my biggest influences were Dimitri Martin, Mitch Hebrow. I was like, sure. Ooh, that's very, that's very non mainstream. Cause my perception of mainstream comedy was storytellers like uh, Bill Cosby or uh, which I know mm. has a lot of baggage to it now yeah. <laughs> uh, or Jeff Foxworthy where there's anecdotes, longer anecdotes. And mm-hmm. I'd never heard like the short absurdic one liner. I was like, I was like, this is this is what comedy. But then you do a little digging into history, and that's just a different take on a really old school totally. style comedy yeah. from like the Borscht Belt and the yeah, Poconos, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like mafia run nightclubs in Brooklyn. Sure, yeah, and it's yeah, it's all just uh, it's all cyclical. It all comes back on itself. It becomes like the different version uh-huh. for a new era. Yeah, it's uh, it it shows you that like none of us are like. You know, it's you know the 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 real originality is being as much yourself as you can. Yeah. You know, like as in, in you know, and that's kind of what you realize. You're like, you know, you like Dimitri. You know, mm-hmm. like even what you know in in his early stuff, and then you meet the new stuff, and you go, oh, I like this too because I have already have this experience with you. Yeah. You know, I I I, it was always interesting to me that like at certain places it was like we we're the most creative but we hate anyone doing creative different than us yes and that and that's why i had a falling out with the punk rock community because i love that music Uh uh-huh but they can be as closed-minded yeah about anything if you are not 
because I never looked to the part. I always dressed like kind of like how you're you're dressed, you know, mm-hmm. hoodies, hoodies, jeans. Sure. Uh, just kind of like, but I just also liked this this music. But if you didn't have like, you know, there's if you didn't have the uniform, then you were an outsider. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's um. It, it is uh, the I always say the the worst people are the diehards for uh-huh. anything. For sports, sports, yeah. religion, religion, punk, <laughs> punk, punk, you know, punk, you know, you know, you know, like, like theater people, theater. I agree with you. Diehards, it's not it, everything's great. It's just the diehards that make you hate it. You know, like, I, I, I agree with that one hundred percent. It always everything's always ruined by the diehards because uh-huh. hey, politics. Oh my god! Again, I was just gonna one. say that's how I'm feeling about this election yeah. year, and it's like there's. The middle on everything isn't as interesting. Like you love passionate people like drive things, but uh-huh. like it's a slippery slope, you know, it, like it's exactly. and you see it with everything. Yeah. And part of me, I wonder, I sometimes wonder if the only thing and I don't know if you would uh, agree with this. I relate some of this back to the way like videos on YouTube work. Mm-hmm. Like very few people are going to watch a movie called some great stuff. Oh, totally. A, a vid- a top 10 great <laughs> yeah. things. But it, but people will click on a video that is top 10 things that are, are terrible about this. Like, this Rise of Skywalker sucks. Here's 10 reasons totally. why. It's, it, it, it's, uh, there's no such thing. Nobody retweets a Matt tweet. Yeah. You like, know? you're pulled to, like, it's pulled to the extremes. And then that's like how, and then everyone starts doing that because I think that's, people see, oh, that gets attention. Of that course. gets eyes on my, on my, th- on my thing or what I'm trying to do. Look at like, kind of like the, you know, I think this is kind of ending now, but like you have like a certain group of comics or like, you know, it's either you're the wokest person alive or you're a huge racist. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) like, it's like, Oh, that's how to get attention. That's how to come out of the scrum quickly, you know, as opposed to like, Oh, you know, I've been working, like you said, you like all of a sudden I looked you up and you have this following and it's like, Yeah, well, I started a podcast seven years ago and I did it every week consistently. And some episodes were funny. Some weren't. I'd go on other people's podcasts and I'd go on and all of a sudden, like I was doing this advice show and now I'm doing an advice show for men. But it's really a show that women would like and women don't really listen to podcasts yet. And then all of a sudden, Serial comes out. Now there's a bunch of women listening to Serial, a murder mystery podcast. (laughs) And now they're looking for other stuff. And now there's a dating (laughs) podcast where this dude gives dating advice from the guy's perspective perspective and they all want to know what a guy thinks and it's like yeah that happened over time you know like exactly it wasn't just me screaming a slur and then a bunch of people being like we believe what he believes give us that you know like we're gonna go to his show you know like it's not you know like and and not to say that it, it doesn't even have to be a slur but you could be construed as this you know symbol for a group now same different yeah yeah, exactly. It's it's very paint. It's very paint by it's it's very paint by number. <laughs> yeah. It's very paint by numbers. Um. <laughs> but I, that's the thing. Like I, I'm very happy, you know, doing comedy right now. Like I'm very happy to do podcasts and stuff. Uh huh. And it's like it just is. I I always treated this as as a career path, not a hobby. So yes, I think that's part of the reason. Like. You know, there's people like you I haven't seen you in a while, like and like mm-hmm. because it wasn't, you know, I, and there's people I haven't seen anyone. There's a bunch of people I haven't seen in a long time. Like uh-huh. someone's, you know, names come up and I go, ah, I miss that guy. That's a great, you know, yeah, yeah. good guy. But I'm like, yeah, but my my pursuit of comedy was never like for a comedy family. It was always like I want a nine to five for comedy, you know, yeah. like I want to create that for myself and. Uh, uh, mics were a means to an end and podcasts are a means to all of it is a means yeah to an end. now and and i kind of want to i kind of want to tr- trace this because because again you're the i feel like you're the result of uh, a very of a very singular driven focus but i, I also feel like you you're I, I i also still just talking to you now i still feel like you still feel like a like a regular guy. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I am. I'm, I'm not where I, <laughs> I can't retire yet. You know, right, right. so like I, I do, uh, you know, it's weird for me because like I'm like doing okay. Like I, but you know, doing okay in comedy is doing great. Like mm-hmm. I'm doing the thing I set out to do, and I'm and every day I try to just keep that going and making it bigger and hopefully funnier. Um, mm-hmm. But it's yeah, it's uh, it's it's um, 
it's definitely hard and you know it's painstaking because like you know we put our like you yeah. put yourself out there so much and you have to be yep. you're at the front lines of getting hurt by that you know oh yeah that's the, the that's and that's the thing that I wish I wish the audience understood more. Yeah, is that that vulner is that vulnerable is that putting being vulnerable uh, really makes uh, really makes it a lot easier to to hurt to hurt oh you if you're doing God. that kind of personal stuff. Uh, it, you know, if you're like doing like take my wife, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there's a certain armor to that. Sure. Um, or or even like the character guys, I feel like there's a certain armor to that. Mm -hmm. But when you're like. Uh, but when you're like doing stuff about yourself and I know, and especially if you're talking about like your dating life and relationships, mm -hmm. you're, I feel like you especially are opening yourself up to really finding out where your flaws are and, oh, yeah. and, and how it's, uh, and how it's affecting your, your life and people's perception of you. Totally. That's the hardest. I mean, we give dating advice on the podcast uh -huh. and I'm, you know, the thing that people seem to enjoy the most is the honesty of it. Uh -huh. And I think you have to be honest about like, especially during times like these where like, you know, um, all the, I don't think the rules are changing, but the rules are being written out, you know, like of dating yeah. and treating people right. And, you know, when you go over like interpersonal relationships, I'm giving like a lot of the times I'm talking about being honest with like my faults. Like mm -hmm. I, I, it's very, you know, like when talking about like people I've dated in the past that, here are the reasons I did the things I did, or here's the reason I ghosted like something as simple as that ghosted yeah. has now been like cartoonified into this, like, Oh, it's just ghosting. Like, ha ha ha. It happens. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, it's a very hurtful, painful thing you're doing to somebody like, yeah. And when we give it a name, like ghosting, everyone like kind of like muddles over the fact of like, Oh, I got ghosted. Ah ha ha. It happens. Well, why do guys ghost? And then it's like, well, when I've ghosted, it's been because I didn't have the words and the and the uh, strength to sell someone that I enjoy mm -hmm. their company. But I don't know how to say that that is now done for me. And it's right. like that's a hard and like when when I talk about that on the podcast, like, you know, it, when you're vulnerable like that, just like you said, like it's easy to look back and like go, well, couldn't you just be stronger? Like. Yeah, I don't know. I'm talking for my past self. Yeah. I wish in I that was moment, better. In yeah. that moment, uh, and and then the answer to to that, I think, would be, well, in that moment, no. Yeah, no, I didn't have that's the why tools. I, that's why I did that. Totally. Yeah, and then you kind of have to like think, well, uh, you know, hopefully, because hopefully, you know, hopefully, you you're never you're not the same person you were like years down the road. Hopefully, totally. You, hopefully, you're you're at a you know, hopefully you, you get the, the tools. Like there's a thing on the bachelor where like when uh -huh. people come on the bachelor, they're like the first thing they say is like, I just want the relationship my parents have. And it's like, yeah, but there's someone out there who hates your dad from dating. <laughs> like there's someone out there yeah. that your dad let down. Well, they were high school sweethearts. Okay. There's a girl who remembers your dad at 13 being a dick. Right. And it's like, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's never again, like kind of the first thing we talked about is just like, it's all found in the middle. It's not, yeah. no one's the bat. No one's, you know, very few saints and there's very few devils, you know, like exactly. it's a little bit in the middle. And it's also like, it's all incentive based. People are just looking to like eat, sleep and fuck, you know, like Asse if you essentially yeah. it down. when you really, when you really do. Yeah. And, and yeah, when you think about just absolutes are very comforting yeah, and, of course. and shades of gray, uh, and dealing with them, and especially I, th and then especially I think uh, now, mm -hmm. in in the like me too in the me too era, yeah, there's lots of there there's lots more shades of gray, and it's and it's very easy to paint stuff. And I'm I'm gonna speak specifically about um, my experience. Uh, my parents got divorced, and mm -hmm. I I know what happened, and I hated him for a really long time. Yeah. Then I learned why why it went down the way it sure. did, and it made more sense. Yeah. So, and it probably made more sense. Uh, what age were you when you made was, more sense? Um, let's see. Uh, they, they they split up when I was sixteen, so maybe, uh, maybe d d d d what? D maybe like twenty four. Twenty four. Like it was you know, a while. You've but that's but that's an age where you're having your own relationships. Yes. You know, you're empathizing with the difficulty of staying with someone, someone mm -hmm. or asking someone out or at or 
ending something or getting uh-huh. ended with like yeah. that. Then you start going, oh, I kind of like I see it, you know, like and it's, you know, that's that makes sense to me. Like, mm-hmm. I understand that. Like, you know, like, listen, like I, I look at my parents, rela- my parents relationship and I'm like, I remember thinking like, man, they fought a lot growing up, but then mm-hmm. they stayed together. Oh, my God. Do I even have the strength to fight with someone like that to then stay with them? You know, like you start looking inside of yourself. You're like, man, am I going to have the ability like theirs was they're in a good marriage and it's hard, you know, and I'm signing up for that. Exactly. How many. And this is something I'd love to love. And I'd I'd love to discuss. And I kind of want to trace your origins somewhat here. How many people in in you've been doing the dating advice podcast for how long? So we give uh, J Train started as the TFM podcast in 2012, um, and it was uh, at first it was the TFM podcast it was a total frat move, which was uh-huh. like they just had a following, and I was like writing for them, and I was like, hey, I want to start a podcast, and they were like, what's a podcast? I was like, perfect, and it just started <laughs> as me talking about stuff from the website, and uh-huh. then at the end we take emails, and very quickly we got a lot of emails. Mm-hmm. And people just kept asking for advice. So we just give life advice. And then it just so happens that 90% of them were dating in relationships. So, yeah. and well, I'm not an expert. I'm just giving, like, it's just easier for me to talk about other people's issues than my own. Sure, so sure. We just have, you know, very honest conversations about people's emails. And, um, and then the you, you up podcast is a second one. And that started like two and a half years ago. And that's with mm-hmm. Betches. And it kind of like Betches is like a female media company and like mm-hmm. they do huge stuff on Instagram. And they were like, we want to start a dating podcast between where male and female co-hosts and Jordana Abraham is one of the women who started Betches and they've started a huge company. And they were like, we're going to put this out in front of like our huge audience. And it really hit. It was like right in the wheelhouse of the people who love what they do. Uh-huh. So awesome. we're given dating advice. That's purely dating advice. Uh-huh. Um. I'm curious, do you think that most people think that good relationships are easy? Be- no. Because I I, had, I think I remember a time, I remember there being, I remember thinking at a time, well, that good relationships aren't hard, like how you described your, your parents. Sure. I think, I may, I answer that too quickly. I, I think people, I think certain things should be easy. I think we all know that relationships are hard. Like that's like the, mm-hmm. like I think everyone understands that, but I don't think people understand that their work, maybe? what the heart is uh-huh. until they get in it. Like I'm recently serious with my girlfriend. Like I'm probably, okay. more, I'm more serious with her than I've ever been with anybody. And the reasons that it's hard isn't for the reasons it was hard when I was just dating, uh-huh. you know, like, with other people, it wasn't, I didn't really care about the fight. Like uh-huh. the argument would happen and then I go, eh, I can just leave this. <laughs> like, I'll just get out of here. Like, sure. It doesn't, I don't need to be here and we'll figure it out and she'll find someone great. And now I'm like in this relationship where I'm like, all right, we're going to fix that. We're going to fix the porch, you know, like on sure. this relationship. So I have to like go back to it. So uh-huh. I don't think people understand what's hard about it, but they know it's going to be hard. It's like, Like there's a like you're sailing through a a storm that's on the horizon. You're like, that's going to be bad. But you don't know what that means. Yeah. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, whether the boat's going to capsize. Sure. Whether there's going to be lightning, sharks, uh, lightning sharks. Yeah. Yeah. Lightning sharks with lightning in their mouths. Yeah. You don't know. (laughs) Yeah. It's just going to going to be rough. So so when you were growing up and and. And and where are you from originally? Outside of Boston. Outside of Boston. Yeah. Okay. Now that now that you say that, that kind of that kind of makes sense. I, yeah. A lot of people tell me they think I'm from Boston. Okay. Also, which I find strange. I don't know why. I feel like I have a lot of like East Coast energy. East Coast energy. It's an East Coast energy. Um, yeah. But uh, okay. So you're, so from outside. So from outside of Boston. And how big a family did you have? Do you have a lot of siblings? Just a younger brother and two younger parents. Bro- just, younger brother yeah. and, and two parents and. And what was your home life like growing up? You said you your your parents were in a good marriage, but you know there was yeah, they're it, pretty. It's just to, like the the fights, just like we were like kind of like you know I was witness to it. It's only four of us, mm-hmm. 
you know, we're all in the same house. It's a, it was a very normal upbringing. Like I lived in a suburb outside of a uh-huh. big city. Sure. Very, you know, went to public high school like that was in the town, played town sports. Like uh-huh. nothing was really uh, very different from most people I knew, uh-huh. you know. So, so you're and you were athletic growing up. What was your sport I tried of choice? to be, you know, I liked playing football. Uh huh. I played football probably my whole life since like eight years old, and I liked that. And I played lacrosse, and I swam. Uh huh. But nothing like I wasn't like extraordinary of an athlete. Like there were, you know, I was just okay. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, and everything was pretty normal. Then I went to Penn State. Yeah. I, I was in, you know, fraternity there, and and what'd you go to to Penn State for? Because that's like I, one of the tops. Is that one? Of the no, best it's not Penn. Been? Oh, okay. so there's Penn. <laughs> so is Penn is an Ivy League school uh-huh. and Penn State's a party school. So gotcha. a lot of, it's funny when people go, oh, you went to Penn. Like when I say I went to Penn State, they'll go, uh-huh. oh, I'll, I'll know right away. They think Penn. Uh-huh. And I go, yes, I, I did go to Penn State. Yeah, you, know, you like can I, work. You can work that. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'll take whatever, whatever you think. Yeah, exactly. Some I don't people, know if there's another Harvard anywhere. No, but. no, no. <laughs> and then some people there's I heard there's a shirt at Penn that says not Penn State. Because they get it the other way. They'll get, sure. ooh, fun time at that school. And they're like, no, I'm actually smart. You know, like, <laughs> like you know, I get the cream of, I get the good side of that situation. They don't. Totally. And when you got to, because, and when you got to uh, to college, did you have that, like, kind of classic frat boy park, uh, college experience? Were you just like this? You don't strike me as a particularly sheltered person. No. But did you get to college and just be like, oh, Beer and women. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's not too far away. I my whole thing with the fraternity stuff, like my parents didn't do a fraternity. It wasn't like I came in being there are some people, again, like the, the diehards ruin everything. Yes. There are some people that are like, My father's father was a member of this house and I shall and I was and like, I, that. and that's why I should be on the Supreme Court. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that type of stuff. Like those people exist. Yeah, uh, especially in college where you're in this like reality, non-reality. You yeah, know? it's like, like the real world. It's the I call college like the like the bumper uh, bumper bowling. Yeah, of it, the it, real world. You're right. It's, it, it's totally that. <laughs> yeah, because you can like bounce off a lot of stuff, but and and then yeah, you can put ice cream on your mac and cheese. Or sure, whatever, anytime but. you want, and then you won't get fat. You exactly. know, like, it's like that's the whole. And you ever you ever watch the cartoon show Recess? Yeah, that's kind of like college, where yeah. like Recess, the whole idea of that cartoon was like we're gonna have the real world, but on the Recess playground. Like uh-huh. we're gonna have this be a metaphor for the real world, and uh-huh. I think that's kind of like what college is, especially. Where I was at school, which is a Big Ten university, where yep. the town is called State College, Pennsylvania, and it's in Happy Valley, and uh-huh. you're three hours from the nearest mega city, and uh, you are the the show, so to speak. So yep. it's it's very easy to get lost in that bubble. I went back. I did this uh, show. Uh huh. Um, I hosted a game show, mm-hmm. and it's on Snapchat, and it's we went to different college football games every week. For fourteen weeks, and one that of the weeks sounds exhausting, but a lot, but fun. The both are very true. Exhausting <laughs> is number one. I lost my voice because I would game show. I was basically like a carnival barker, so I'm like yelling yeah. the whole time. And um, but we went back to Penn State one of the weeks, and I would uh-huh. write these like long college reviews after I would because I would fly back every Sunday mm-hmm. to the city. And I got this like viewpoint of a college town that had no biases. Yeah. Like uh, that was my thought on writing these things. It's still in my Instagram highlights right now, but it was like basically like basically I was writing a travel book for these college shows Mm -hmm. on my own Instagram highlights. And it was interesting. Penn State, my biggest thing was how of all the schools we went to, and I tried to be as unbiased as possible having been an alumni there, but my whole premise was... I'm not paying to go to these schools on vacation. So right. there was no, I have no reason to like or lo- hate your school. I really don't. So mm-hmm. I remember Penn State, my biggest takeaway was like the bubbles thicker there uh-huh. because it is far away from cities. You don't deal. Everyone that comes back is coming back for their big weekend to feel like they're a college kid again. Yeah. So even if you see an adult, the adult's acting like a child. Uh-huh. You know, and I remember pe- we were taping. We had we did a 
the Penn State episode was from a fraternity lawn. Uh-huh. And this guy, and it's a game day, this guy walks by with a jersey on, and he we had a bunch of wings out, like food for the whole uh-huh. uh, crew. Yeah, yeah. So the whole the wings are out. This guy comes up. He's 20. He's hammer drunk. Uh-huh. He picks up a wing, not asking nothing, just picks up a wing, starts eating. He goes, lights, camera, action. What's the deal? And I'm like, dude, what are you like? What Vinny Barbarino? Like, who do you think you are? You just walked up to a full set with adults, picked up our food, gave us a line, lights, camera, action, what's the deal here? As if we, you were the mayor of town. Right. And th- in, in his mind, he's like, yeah, I need to know what's going on. You're on my block. You got to tell me what you guys are doing here. More people did shit like that in Penn State than anywhere else we were. Because yeah. there's no repercussion. If we looked at him and uh-huh. go, hey, put down the fucking wing, he'd go... Why? I'm uh this is the street I live on. You're not just allowed to come here without checking in with me. And it's like to him he's right. He's, sure, sure. He's drinking on a football Saturday. The world is his oyster. He steps over you. And it's like that is the most Penn State experience. Like yeah. we had so many women at Penn State come up to us and go, What's like we had a big backdrop for when we taped. Mm-hmm. What's this? It's like should we have checked in with you before oh, we didn't get the zoning permit from from Jessica. <laughs> you know, like we had Kappa Delta. Yeah, we didn't right. check in with Kappa Delta <laughs> right. to see if we were allowed to tape on the set. Like oh, only that type of like type of privilege and and like um yeah, there's privilege. Narcissism. There's privilege, and then there's like that kind of privilege. That's the type of privilege and narcissism that only happens at a Big Ten school that's far away from a big town. Exactly. Because no one is there to hire you. No one's there to fire you. You're the king of uh, Happy Valley for the four years. Have fun. Yeah. Just exactly. don't get killed. And people do, you know, uh, tragically, people fucking, you know, oh, drink yeah. their way out of that school all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I went to Towson, which is has this reputation for being a party school. I was not. I was going around that because I was in class and mm-hmm. I was, I was a theater kid. So, but you can find your own thing at every school. Like yeah. I like. There's someone that went to Penn State that hears me talk about Penn State that way. They're like, that is that's not, not my experience at all. And I'm like, I'm just. But they know that experience exists. It does. Yeah. The the memory I I recall is that um one one year there was this big concert that happened at the end of every year and. Yeah. Uh, one year the band was Dashboard Confessional. I love that. Love band. them. I love them. They weren't played... they one felt swoop before they were Dashboard Confess- Confessional. Uh, Didn't they have another he... name? Well, he well Chris Caraba used to play sing for the band Further Seems Forever. Which Maybe wrote... that's it. He and then he started Dashboard as a side project. I remember I wasn't I was out of town, so I wasn't at the show. But I remember reading in the paper that it was like ten songs, and it was mostly him telling the crowd to chill out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah, yeah, yeah. that's pretty much was like, y- yep, I could I could see that yeah, exactly. Immature how that's kids play, ruin everything. You know? Yeah, the year I the year I went was uh, Third Eye Blind and Vertical Horizon. Okay, that, that was. Uh, that was um that was actually a great show and a lot of people made jokes about it. Oh, is it nineteen ninety seven again? Sure. Um, yeah. I I think I also I find the the I find the uh, the new thing of like oh uh, artists being around for a while like oh is it this this year? I'm like we're that's what we're all trying to do. Yeah. Hope that you're rel- hope that you're still doing the thing you want to do I ten mean, years it, after you're relevant. It, it's um, I hear it from people like like. Oh, you're the guy that wrote for Total Frat Move. You're the, t- t- and, uh, are you the bro Bible? Or, and it's like they almost like take you down for the thing. Like it's like for the thing you did, were working hard at to get to ha- to be seen by you today. Yeah. And it's like, I remember you when you did. And it's like, there's a, it, it's interesting that like there's a tone for everything. And uh-huh. there you, that tone of like, Oh, I remember you when I used to be a fucking idiot. I liked your stuff. And it's like, well, okay, maybe you like the new stuff too. That makes you, you know, you'll think you're a fucking idiot 10 years from now, you know, like, yeah, it is. Exactly. Everything has, you know, it's so funny. Like the nostalgia stuff. It, it's only, you know, everyone gets their time to be hated, liked, loved, disliked. Yeah. You know. And then I think eventually if you stay in it long enough, even if you're hated initially, you eventually come around to being loved because uh, I 
I there's a YouTube channel I follow called the Punk Rock NBA that talked mm-hmm. about this recently, and he was talking about uh, the band Slipknot. People mm-hmm. hated Slipknot when they were. F- for when they first came out Mm -hmm. like they had fans but they weren't respected by like the metal community (laughs) okay it was too mainstream of metal or or it was like not real metal or or whatever and and they didn't like the masks like you're you guys are gimmick you're not you're not a real band and they stayed around long enough and made enough good music where now nowadays people are like oh yeah it's like slipknot they're they're great you you know you gotta be more like them it's it's so funny to me it's a that that circle (laughs) It's a funny lesson, too, where it's like if you're putting stuff out there like, yeah, not every day is the day. You, not everything you make is going to be, mm-hmm. you know, liked or loved at that moment or understood. But it's like it gets you to the next thing that maybe is the thing that makes people really enjoy it. You know, like, oh, yeah, it's all like appreciation happens backwards, not forwards a lot. The people it happens forwards for are the people that are like the early adopters that are like, you know, they're probably the least fucked up people. You know, like, yeah, they're like they're like, oh, like the people that come to you. Oh, you're doing comedy. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Where, what, you know, like, you know, the tone when someone asks you about comedy, like there's a yep. fucked up tone that they're they have their own issues. I saw a guy. This happened the other night. I was at a show uh-huh. and there was this guy's show and he's a nice guy. He's a funny comic and he does his show and he's hosting it. But then he brought up his like buddy. Uh-huh. They did some sort of shtick where the buddy came on stage and he didn't do comedy it was a weird thing i don't i walked in late Uh but i just saw them get on stage together and one is a comedian one's this other guy right who has a huge beard and gray hair he looks like he looked like he was out he was like a model like an old model Uh (laughs) like it's like he just had a very specific look Mm -hmm. and the bit was he was asking the comedian questions that people had from the audience, but the bit he thought he was doing was to be mean to him. Like that was like the whole joke is right. that he goes, so they say that comedians are negative assholes and fucked up from childhood. He goes over this whole list of horrible attributes that he would apply to a comedian. Uh-huh. And then he ends it by going, so what's your deal? And that was like his big joke was like, so which of those applies to you? And I remember like I'm watching this and I'm like, this guy is the guy asking the questions is a miserable fuck. Like Mm -hmm. he needed to make sure that all comedians are miserable assholes so that he doesn't think that so that he's not the asshole. Yeah. It was this like weird, like psychological moment. Uh And I'm watching this all happen. I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to talk to that guy ever. He's never going to be supportive. He's never going to like this is supposedly his friend. And he just cut him down on stage in front of everybody. Like, yeah, he just made him like whether this guy can never deny that comedians are miserable people because he just made it in this world where comedians are all miserable people who hate the world. And it's like because they got to talk to him. Yeah, exactly. Maybe maybe you're the problem. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And that's the thing. Like, he doesn't want to admit he's the problem, so he makes comedians these these awful people. And it's like, you know, some people you're never going to, like, figure out their shit for them. You know, like, the best mm-hmm. people are like, like, if that guy came on stage and was, like, positive, I don't know if it would have been funnier, but at least it would have yeah. been, like, more fun to watch. <laughs> like, I was like, exactly. oh, what's your problem? Yeah, you need some, like, you need a couple of, like, check spots at the comic strip to beat that kind of nonsense out of you. (laughs) To just not feel like... It was just this weird moment. I just watched it and I was like, it didn't make me feel good. It made me feel like I was like, that guy has his own. And I get that more... And you probably get that too. We all get that where it's like someone comes up to you and makes their issues yours by being miserable around your thing that you love to do. Yes. You know, absolutely. Like, and it's like, that's absolutely. Happened. Yeah. And you're just like, wait, why am I going to feel badly now? I just answered your question about my set. You know, like, <laughs> exactly. Like, how did this happen? Yeah. One, one, 100 percent, 100 percent. Like it is. It is so it is so strange, like watching people project onto you because oh I because like because that's like the one thing like being funny is the one thing I think almost everybody thinks they are. Sure. And comedians threaten uh, they're they're they, they, they threaten an insecurity with some people there's a big difference between having a good personality and being funny and that's like the biggest difference between going on stage and not 
Yeah. And then there's, I have a ton of friends that have great personalities that I would never call funny. Yeah. You know, like it's just, and that's not a dig on them, but it sounds like such a dig. Like it sounds like such an elitist thing. Like, do you know how many dates I went on or how many people I talked to? Like, you know, especially like it doesn't, male or female, it doesn't matter. Just like mm -hmm. anyone I've talked to, I was like, oh, I'm a comedian. And they're offended by saying what you do. <laughs> like they immediately get offended by your job title. Uh -huh. Like I've never been like, you know, we've heard this a million times where it's like, oh, I'm a doctor. Oh, you think you're a doctor, huh? Like, <laughs> well, I trained for like many years. Like no one really oh, yeah? respects the training of a comedian. Yeah, know? exactly. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, uh, well, uh, quote some medical text to me right yeah, now. Yeah, right or, now. Uh, argue, argue a case. I had a guy, I was in LA and I was in a meeting and just like a general, just like, uh-huh whatever those bullshit things and he goes like go in and like oh make us make us laugh mon monkey kind of a little bit like i walked in i was like hey nice to meet you and he's like oh what are you doing in town and he's like you're doing spots that's how he said it to me <laughs> you're doing spots and i was like oh my god and i go well actually like and i like i i don't really want to go up from there with him uh -huh. like i don't want to like elevate that conversation yeah doing spots like i gotta like i i'm like i i have to like understand like yeah this guy has a negative connotation with comedians like this guy obviously has met comedians that he thinks are pieces of shit uh-huh totally i can understand that i've met pieces of shit comedians myself Same. so Same. like i understand totally. where he's coming from but his aggression right away are you doing spots i'm like he obviously thinks a certain type of guy does comedy i uh -huh. understand that I'm not going to come in and be that guy for him. Like, I was like, yeah, I did. I, and I said, to him, I go, this is how I answer. I just go, yeah, I did the improv last night. It was a lot of fun. Um, I'm actually, I'm just here to like, I'm actually doing shows this weekend in San Diego. And then, but I'm, I'm doing a couple podcasts while I'm here. It's, isn't it weird that LA, and I said, I was like, isn't it weird that people go to LA to do podcasts now? And he yeah. was like, and he was like, like, you could feel his energy just kind of like turn down a little bit. Like, I, at least I, it uh -huh. wasn't like I was sitting there telling him how funny I was. I think a lot of people think you're going to like, oh, I'm a comedian. And now you're going to learn how funny I am compared to you. And it's like, that's not what I, I just want to fucking work. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's all any of us. That's all any of us are trying or <laughs> yeah. trying to do. You know, there's, there's a couple met people who are like, have some undiagnosed mental illness, but most of us yeah. are just trying to. <laughs> yeah. The $5 open mics you know, yeah. instead of therapy. I get it. Yeah. Like I, I, <laughs> I get why he's that way, and I think the one thing, like, I try not to take things too personally. Like, I did, like, when he said, any spots? I was like, yeah, you know, yeah, I get I'm, it. I'm, I'm performing <laughs> ar around town a bit, but then I've got these uh, doing some podcasts. Yeah, so. I'd like to work with you and make money. That's yeah, <laughs> exa exactly. Let's, let's, let's drop the artifice here. Totally. <laughs> um, um, so I kind of want to trace a, a little bit so... Um, so and what did you end up going to school for? Economics. Economics. Yeah. Interesting. And then so it was the only one that in the business school that had no GPA requirement. <laughs> That's why. Excellent. So so you you and you graduated. Yeah. So you get out of school and then what brings what gets you to a uh, comedian in New York City? Because so so far like sure. that that stereotype that that guy had of comedians that's not the journey. So I'm curious yeah. where this starts. I started uh, selling life insurance. I worked at like a life, uh, life insurance company and uh -huh. um, I really tried hard to make that like a career. Like I really tried my darndest mm -hmm. to like make that happen. And I, I realized quickly it wasn't for me. Um, I wasn't enjoying myself. Yeah. I was going out with friends in the city and doing like New York, like finance bro stuff. Like I was at the, like the first Santa con, like all that stuff. Uh -huh. Like I, I was doing what people, you know, like going out in grand like wall street or not Berlin. even like a, like a poor man's version of that. Like I wish <laughs> it was that glamorous. Like it was just like doing the normal white guy from a big 10 school moving to the city Mm -hmm. Living with a roommate in, in Murray Hill than the roommate, you know, like, ah, uh, yes, Murray all Hill. Kind of like the normal stuff that, you know, people might run away from. Like, they'd be like, well, I'm not that. Like, you are. Sure. You know, like yeah. going to like different bars and day drinking and like, you know, trying to make this work happen of like, I was cold calling. Like, they tell you when you work in life insurance, 
They're like, well, you bring in your friends and family and then they tell their friends and family and then they t- and then you become their financial advisor because you use the interesting kind of like you have one person on top and then you have a few people under yeah, that and then you a, have a few more people under it's in that. the shape of a triangle yeah I, uh, interesting they well there was a lot of people doing that so like i think i was a little naive to the realities of life um mm-hmm. when i came in there because i was like you and also the financial collapse happened 2007 yeah, yeah. is when i'm going into call and i was like i'm not gonna ask my parents for money i don't want to do it that way Mm -hmm. so i started cold calling people like i would literally call like you know fine you know investment firms i would call like credit swiss and i'd be like hey this is jared freed calling from blankety blank and blankety blank and uh i'd love to do your financial planning and i remember one time a woman picked up and she was like everyone on the floor has been fired and then hung up on me and i was like oh my god yeah like i didn't realize the severity of it and then you're meeting with people. I would do. You're doing retail finance, so like yeah. you're meeting with people, being like, <clears throat> like, <clears throat> like you and your fiance, you guys are getting married. So mm-hmm. like I would meet with you as a couple, and I'd yeah. be like, oh, what are your goals over the next five, ten, fifteen, twenty years? And how much money do you make? And how much does she make? And do you plan on having a children? You're going over that with people, and you're like, yeah, man, life is very um, uh, tough, monotonous. Um, everyone has the same fears. Everyone just wants to go to work and eat and get laid. Like you can like, yeah, you see it right in front of you. And I just, I, it wasn't, I just, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I loved being funny for friends. Uh-huh. I love talking about TV with my dad. Um, my good friend and I in the fraternity, like we would do, we literally do sketch comedy without knowing that's what we were doing. Like people uh-huh. would come in and listen. I remember people would come into our fraternity room and we lived together and they go, I just want to hear, we'd be like, what are you doing there? They're like, I don't know. I was bored. I, I figured I'd come listen to you guys talk. Like we do our <laughs> own podcast for one person. Sure. And again, you look back at these things and yeah. they all make sense. But like, I loved being funny for friends. I loved writing an email to a group of people when the weekend we were all supposed to hang out. So like I would spend most of my day writing these emails back to a big group. And then someone would go off email and be like, dude, that was the funniest thing I've read all day. And I'd be like, wow, that made me feel so good. So I was like, how do I inject that drug into my vein every day? You know, how do I be funny for some, how do I get that off group email email where yeah. someone goes jared that was fucking hilarious i love that <laughs> and i wanted that and that's yeah so i lived across the street from bra from new york comedy club mm-hmm. and i would walk by it every day and i would look in the window and i was afraid to do it and um i was like i think i'm gonna be i want to and as simple as i want to be funny for money that was like yeah. i broke it down to that mm-hmm. and that was always the goal like i i'm not a bit like it wasn't like i was like sitting there with prior albums in my room. Like I was sure. never that type. The really, the only stand up special I really knew and loved was Kevin James sweat, the small stuff, which is a classic special. It's an amazing special. That special is so good. It has it's, such it's great jokes on such it. Such great jokes that still work. And yeah, I loved how physical he was. Like I loved that idea of like, uh, you know, you're moving on stage. It's a 3d thing. Um, yeah, that's something I had to come to later, but I, I definitely, I, I came to appreciate that and might have also had to been with uh, Modi really <laughs> saying something hurtful to me at the oh, comic really? strip. Oh, no. Uh, during my, uh, well, you know, during my like late night audition to get passed sure. for a late night, this was back when they would have like a panel of comedians like yeah, critique you on stage. <laughs> and they thought uh, it was going to be, it was going to be like next com- last, last comic, comic standing, standing, but for, for, for the comic, comic strip. strip yeah. yeah. And, uh, this was, uh, I was still very, very, I was very new to New York mm-hmm. uh, at this time. So I was still coming into my own as a perf- on stage mm-hmm. and M- Modi and Modi, like <laughs> Modi just hit my stage for it. He was like, you have no stage presence and <laughs> you, you know, you got to move around. You should move around on stage. And then, um, uh, who's the, uh, I'm, I'm, bl- I'm blanking on his name right now, but he did a podcast with Patrice O'Neill called the beige Philip. Oh, Dante Nero. Dante Nero. Yeah, Dante's great. Dante, yeah. he, Dante said I had childbearing hips that, and nothing else. Uh, we <laughs> laughed. The problem with that show is like, they have to be funny so they can only be mean. 
Right. And you know, it, like, and and we've laughed about it. We we've, sure. we've laughed about it. We laughed about it after, but and then Dustin Chafin just said showmanship, showmanship, showmanship over mm-hmm. and over again. Um so I event and then also realizing like, hey, Gabriel Iglesias is pretty likable and has good stories and he does funny voices. It couldn't hurt to incorporate other things into telling jokes sure and but also you got to be you like you know like and i'm gonna do it like me do it like you you know like and like those competition shows like those never did well for me like i never you know i you know like it's funny to hear that story because i remember those that when they did that show and i remember lining up around the corner yep to get your one spot to do late nights. And that was going like to be your six big months savior yeah. because you wouldn't have to sign up for open mics and you could get a time to go on stage. And you realize like all this stuff is like just experiences to get to the next experience. And it's like, yeah. and it's, it's funny because like they turn into that and it's like, what is this going to go? Like, you know, this yeah. is a big moment for you. And on top of the big moment, they're going to go through and do their roast. Like, it's like, <laughs> right. It's crazy. It's, yeah. um, but I, I kind of back away from a lot of stuff like that. Like, yeah. I, I, especially because, you know, you know, back to like, I mean, the reason I did it, I was like, I want this to be my whole life. Mm-hmm. So like, I do get very upset by comedy. Like I do get very upset by things not working out because it is. And I think that was the big reason when I was selling life insurance, like I'd have bad days and they didn't really suck that much. Uh You know, I was like, Oh, I want it to suck. I want it to want to feel something. Yeah. I want it to be miserable. Like I want it to be like, because I failed, not because, you know, where I can get better, where you, just like you're saying, like I can, next time I come up, I'm going to have those things in my act that make me have better showmanship. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I wanted to be able to like go back and you know, tinker with it and make it uh-huh. better. So yeah, that was uh but yeah, I understand it's yeah. uh so I like Kevin James. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like Kevin James. And then you pretty much you're just like go right into stand up New York and you're, you're doing mics, bringers. No, I signed up for like everything. I signed uh-huh. up for like you know, like improv and sketch writing uh-huh. and at like Chicago City Limits and at um ucb and um i reached out to like i went to stand-up shows and i would like talk, try and talk to some of the comics ask them questions and i ended up you know you know talking to the comics like in that way but like this was really me i was like okay i'm gonna go to grad school for this like i'm yeah. really gonna like figure out, i and i i remember i left my job very early like way mm-hmm. earlier than most people get the chance to do like i'm very lucky for that opportunity like, yeah I had some bar mitzvah money st- stashed away and it's like, <laughs> all right, this is the business I'm starting. And that sounds stupid, but I was like, no, I'm going to attack this. Like I would, if I started a, you know, a cup company, yeah, you know, like, like a, a, yeah, like a, a small business, small business. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I'm kind of curious that, about that then because the, like this show is my, uh, that's what I'm doing now. I'm coming mm-hmm. to it years, years later. Uh, what is something if you were, if you were going to give like a comic, like some like mm-hmm. business advice. Sure. What are like what are like some couple things that you you think more comics should be doing or what are some things that you wish you could have avoided? Um I think it's hard um it's really hard to do comedy if you're I think you want if you're like a new comic. Mm-hmm. I think making sure the money side of things has been put on autopilot. Yeah. So, and I know that sounds like, Oh, Jared, you know, Mm -hmm. money on autopilot. Like how easy is your life? Well, when you look at your life, how much are you spending on a weekly basis? Take the average of the last year. Mm -hmm. You can find that out. You can figure that out. How much do you spend on a monthly basis? How much do you need to live? Yeah. I remember when I left my job and when I was going to, I was like, gonna. this is all I'm doing ever, forever. Yeah. My dad was like, well, you got no wife and no mortgage and no kids. Go for it. What else? What, you know, Mm -hmm. what do you have? What are your worries? You know, like and he's relating his worries to mine. Sure. And he was like very and that's the most supportive I think anyone can be to their kid. Like that's a very I'm mm-hmm. very lucky. My mom didn't get it. She's like, well, what am I going to tell my friend? You know, like that's her yeah, worries. Yeah. But I'm very lucky um, in that sense. But I think when you do the math on it and that becomes 
relieved by the bath. It's no emotions. Mm-hmm. Like, because it can get emotional. You're like, well, where's the rent going to come from? Yeah. I don't know where it's going to come from. So, like, I remember someone was like, um, should I ask me if they should leave their job? And I was like, well, what is your job now? And they're like, well, I go and I temp every day and I go in from like 10 to 3. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I will keep that as long as fucking possible because yeah. you've worked it out. Mm-hmm. You know, 10 to 3, I can go into my job and I know I can take days off when I need to take a week, when I get a, lucky enough to get a weekend. Yeah. You know, like, but don't do, like, if you're going to do a, a job while you do stand up, make the job like part of your stand up. Like, make it mm-hmm. work for stand up. Don't make. You know, does that make sense? It it does. And I'm seeing how that applies to my life because my job is in pod. My day job is in podcast. OK, so I have uh, and I have resources that I didn't have when I when I started. Totally. That are I think that the, as as far as like getting like 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 we've been we've known each other for a while. Sure. But like I, you know, I have been able to get some like big guests and like bands that I'm and like musicians I'm, totally. I'm into. So. I've I've have I've had a little bit of a bit of luck in that, but it it makes perfect sense. You don't want you want as few things getting in the way of the goal as possible. Your job as a stand up is to be a comedian. Yes. That's I think that's the thing that gets lost in a lot of people is like you don't you're not a hobbyist. You yeah. are becoming a comedian and you have to make the decision. Like if you want to be a hobbyist, that's okay too. Mm. But if you wanted this to work, there's someone else putting in more hours than you right now. Yeah. At at every level. And at every level. So there's someone at the open mics that's getting up four times a night. Are you getting up four times a night? Do you need that to get the new new minute a week? I, I live by the minute a week uh-huh. theory. So if I have a new minute every week, I have 52 minutes in a year that I have an hour after the year is done. Yeah. So I try and break everything down that way. So even with my material, do I have a new minute? You know, mm-hmm. it's all the these are ways to keep yourself honest. So I think like if you say to yourself, I need a thousand dollars a week. Mm-hmm. That's what I need coming in. And you're like, I got a job that I walk dogs and I get a thousand dollar a week from that job. Great. That's done. Uh-huh. Now you now the rest is comedy. Yeah. You know, like now you're not worried about the thousand a week. You got the dogs that you walk and you get that done. And now that is stationed away and you can schedule around that to make sure you're going after your real job, which is being a comedian. Yeah. So it's like. I think a lot of people forget that as they get into this being like, oh, I'm just trying to get drunk and meet people and have fun. And it's like, yeah, that can be great for a while. But like, don't be upset that you didn't get the, you know, to the next level sure. because you've never made this a career. Yeah. Like, I, I think I've made it. I've been brutally protective of it. Like mm-hmm. I and I like a kid. Yeah, yeah. Like when I went on dates with girls, if I go out for a date and then they were like, well, what are you doing? And then I had to cancel last minute because the spot came up. Yeah. They would go, well, what are, what about the date? I go, got to do the spot. Uh-huh. Like it's always going to come. Like, you know, the baby's going to come first. Of course. So it's we say, of course. And then you have the outside world is like like nothing is easier than when you have like nothing was easier to me than when it was like, OK, I'm going to go to Eastville at five. I'm going to go to. You know, stand up New York at six and then I'm going to do the pit at 11. Mm -hmm. That's like, oh, my God, I got my five, my six right again in the middle. Uh Have some dinner. Go to the 11. Go to bed. Like, that's an easy life that I'm Mm -hmm. I'm, all I'm thinking about is comedy. Yeah. It's like, how do I get life to be just that meat? Yeah. And I think that's the hardest part about being a comic is like, okay, but I got to pay my rent and I got to you know, go to my job yeah. and I got my all day job stuff. and I got it's all the other stuff that gets in the way of like, how do I get to those three times on stage where I'm just doing the bit, you know? And it's yes. like, I, I, and again, like I have two podcasts. So like, right. So my you day got a job, lot of time of recording also. That's the thing. Life changes. My job, my day job is the podcast. My day job is yelling at The Bachelor. My day yeah. job is tweeting. My day job. And it's like, okay, when do I get those three open mics in the night where I can just work on the bit? Like, I'm I'm having mm-hmm. trouble with that now. Like, and mm-hmm. even like I'm traveling every weekend and I've been opening for uh, Michelle Wolf. And like, oh, cool. I open for her like a good amount of time. I'm going with her next week. And it's like. I know that I get that whole week to just be comic Jared free, not podcaster, not tweeter, not, you know, like, and it's like you have the scheduling and putting aside the other shit mm-hmm. that gets in the way is so important because you got to get that new minute a week. Right. I, and that for me is very hard and been helpful at the same time. Like, yeah. Minute a week. I, that I, I feel like that, 
this is probably like the first time I'm hearing that. That's I'm, a Bill I'm Burr thing. Hearing that, I got it from Bill Burr. Okay, Ex- excellent. And and he's a, he's a good guy to emulate. Something I was I was saying way earlier uh, when we were talking about like misinterpretations of things. Like I wish fewer more comics understood the nuances of Bill Burr and Patrice O'Neill mm. and didn't just hear like the naughty words sure. and the, and the like or and think oh be misogynist. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like there's a lot more going on there. So again, the diehards are worse the than die- the fans. You know, like <laughs> yes. you know, like the diehards want to go. I had a guy. He wrote me. This is a perfect example. People hear uh-huh. what they want to hear. Uh-huh. I got a DM and I have shows coming up in Boston mm-hmm. and he wrote me 75 pounds heavier to like a picture that was up of me and uh-huh. I was 75 pounds heavier and I go, what? He goes, then this picture. And I go, I blocked him right away. I was like, fuck yeah. off. What the fuck? Yeah, First of all, that would make it. me 800 pounds. Like, no. Uh-huh. And uh, no, that's fucked up. That's a mean thing to write to someone that I don't even know you. I don't know you on that level. Yeah. He finds another account on Instagram, writes me. He's like, oh, you got fucking butt hurt about the 75 pounds thing. I, and I wrote back to him. I go, no, dude, I don't know you. I'm not your friend. I also didn't know what the fuck you were talking about. And he goes, you make fun of the bachelor. You called so-and-so an ugly bitch. And I'm like, that's not what I said. I was like, if, if I was on right. if I was on Instagram telling women they look like ugly bitches, no women would watch this. And my audience is 86% women. Yes. So I go, you heard ugly bitch. You put that in your head and you didn't see the joke and that the nuance and any of it that was going into it. Like Mm -hmm. you created a a world where I'm the same as you when I'm not. There's a reason your girlfriend loves what I do. And it's not (laughs) because she's attracted to me because I've gained 75 pounds. Right. You know, clearly, clearly. So (laughs) turn it back. uh, Yeah, exactly. And he he wrote to me. He was like, I, you know, I guess I didn't see it. He actually was uh, apologizing. I was like, hey, man, we're cool. I was like, you just don't own me like that. Right. And it's like, but I understand like where it's like Uh Bill Burton and Patrice O'Neill, like there's no better bit than when Patrice goes does the whole Natalie Holloway thing. Like like that guy uh-huh. knew comedy so well, he knew how the audience was going to react even before they did. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, he, his psychology of the the, the crowd was just... Fantastic. Fan- fantastic. Or my, my other favorite one was, I think it, it might have been his, like, maybe like HBO, not his Comedy Central Hour, but uh, maybe like an HBO One Night Stand or something mm. where he's like doing crowd work and he's like, oh, if, you, uh, you know, ladies, if, you're, uh, if your vagina closed up, how would you... How would you keep your man? And then people yeah. start shouting out anal. And then it's like, oh, so you just objectified yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah. That bit's like, it's crazy. Yeah. How? Le- like legitimately crazy. But also it's like, oh, kind of. <laughs> that it, That is sort of what is happening. Yeah, of course. I love, I love, I love jokes where you can make, where you can take someone who's very self, again, diehards. Sure. Uh, where you can just take diehards and just poke holes in whatever their thing is. Yeah, you take the 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 unaware and make them aware. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If it, and that that's kind of helpful cuz then maybe maybe they'll best case scenario they maybe th- approach things differently. Yeah, worst case scenario they scream at you until they get kicked out of the club. Exactly. <laughs> 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 it's like you will not you will not get a refund on those two yeah, drinks. No, 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 you're gone. <laughs> yeah. Um well that's great man. I didn't know you were opening for Michelle. That's so awesome because yeah, like it's fun. and and it's I love I love the fact that we had to we've had to reschedule like six or seven times yeah, I'm because sorry, dude, <laughs> it is totally cool because you're doing the thing that we're all trying to figure out how to do when we're just in the basement in in the creek sure. trying to be our trying to be ourselves. Totally. And, and that's that's a very that is a very cool thing, I think. It's very exciting and um yeah, it's really cool. It's it's been fun. Like I again, like I, it's hard sometimes to realize. Like, you know, everyone's trying to keep moving up, up and up and up, and more, 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 and extra. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it is very nice. It's like been fun and like, you know, especially you know, again back to that thing of like just doing comedy, like just yep. making the funny thing and all the other bullshit that goes around it, like it's fun to open for Michelle because she has her audience. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're a little bit different from me. They're not expecting me. And I get to like work on the muscle of doing, you know, bits that her audience would love that I love doing that her audience and seeing 
fashioning it for them mm-hmm. so that I can go back to the audience that comes to see me that wants to hear about The Bachelor. Uh-huh. And I can be like, and we're going to talk about this social issue. And they're like, you? <laughs> right. And I'm like, I don't know. I give it a shit. Yeah. It worked with these people. Let's see if it works with you. You yeah. know, like I got, so, got some stuff to think. I got to watch her new special because I love that. I love that bit she does about like the women's march when like older she goes like older guys are saying like oh women are organizing so it's like, funny don't worry it's gonna fall apart yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, she's that joke is so good her special watch. is so good I gotta watch it's, the whole it's thing it's laugh 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 and she's like someone that I look at like when I talk about these things where I'm like you know where I'm talking about like you know getting to that point of the three mics and writing just uh-huh. doing comedy she's so good at that she's so good at like you know taking the stuff she's writing and doing it on stage right away like in a way that like i you know i'm like fuck i gotta get better at that you know? yeah i yeah i watch i like you know i i look at you and i look at her i'm like uh it's like i gotta it's inspiring but then i'm also I'm like i'm inspired to work harder yeah because like I, I i tech shows at the at the pit like i do lights and sound for shows sure. at the pit and i remember like my first couple of years in New York, always hitting that 11 o'clock Tuesday mic that, yeah. that she hosted. And now she's getting attacked by the president. Yeah, it's crazy. The whole thing is Twitter. crazy. It's it so feels gnarly. Like a, it feels like when they, when people talk about like the, um, the, uh, what's it called? The, uh, the simulation. Mm-hmm. Like that's the type of stuff that I'm like, Oh my God, we're, you know, met, you know, at the pit at 11 o'clock at night on a Tuesday. Uh-huh. And now, you know, you're like, is that? Am I in a ma- in a dream? Yeah, it does. Yeah, exactly. Weird. It's it it definitely feels like a oh okay. I'm not in control of this anymore. There is somebody. There's <laughs> microphones in yeah. the walls somewhere. Yeah, it's wild. It is, man. Dude, thank you so much for doing this. this thank has you been, for having me. This is so great. This has been great. Uh, I'll put this out tomorrow. Is there any dates we can plug? Uh, I would love that. I'm gonna be Boston, Laugh Boston, the 19th to the 21st of March. And then I'm going to be at Gotham April 17th and 18th. Those are the next two. But I um, I really love doing stuff on Instagram. I like Instagram is like where I like cool. really love hanging out. Um, I yell at The Bachelor every Monday night. So this will come out tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I'm yelling at The Bachelor tonight. And then um, I'll, I'll my highlights. So if you go to my highlights on Instagram, mm-hmm. every episode of The Bachelorette and The Bachelor from the last two seasons are there. So you can kind of see what I do if you like that type of stuff. Um yeah, at Jared Freed. That's where. That's really where it all happens on Instagram. Cool, man. Sounds good. Well, I'll I will fo- I'll follow you there, and uh, I just started following you on Twitter, so I can Sweet. keep up with you there, man. And uh, this is this is great. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we're uh, I get to we're see, see you again. each other more often. Yeah, exactly. This is great. Awesome, dude, man. Thank you so much, dude, I Really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Really appreciate it, dude. Okay, folks, that's our show. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you being here. Uh, as always, a big thank you to my guest. I appreciate uh, appreciate it, Jared, for your time and your candor. And I uh, also want to give a shout-out to my supporter on Patreon at the awesome producer level, uh, Mary Beth Mooney. Thank you so much for your support. I appreciate you, and uh, I'm glad that uh, we're friends. And uh, if you guys want to check out what I'm doing on um, awesome uh, – over on Patreon, you can check out uh, patreon.com slash awesome disaster. You can check out some of the exclusive stuff that I've got ongoing there. And as I said at the top, uh, reach out to me. I want to hear from you guys. Uh, I am on Twitter at comic will carry at awesome depod, and I am on Instagram at will carry two three. Uh, hit me up on any of those platforms, and uh, maybe you'll hear uh, a message uh, in the intro on uh, a future episode. Thank you guys again uh, for being here. I sincerely appreciate it. And I will see you next week between awesome and disaster. Take care, everybody.